Brought to you by Accenture Extended Reality. This is Field of View. Welcome to Field of View where we are going to be talking with a fantastic guest uh, today in this lineup and they're going to provide some pretty interesting insight I guess into you know their start and journey into the world of XR but also the future as well. Yeah we're going to have some insights about uh, the new products that uh, uh, this company uh, this guy is working in uh, is going to launch next year. We're going to have some insight about the products that uh, they just launched uh, just literally a few weeks ago and uh, we're going to have a view of uh, uh, the past of VR and we're going to have a view on the future the foreseeable future of VR. And, and Nick, I guess what's really interesting and when we set out to do Field of View uh, kind of together was, was really about bringing information that people don't normally have access to, right? Like how to get into the industry and how things start and, and you're not necessarily just like knowing what's going on now, but you know, the, the, the journey involved, right? That's right, Daniel. Basically, our goal is to provide an insider view on uh, the lives of uh, main players in the immersive industry. Just before we jump into our guest today, I think the biggest thing that we wanted to, to highlight as well is that Field of View is a podcast where we want to get you, the viewer, involved. So if you're listening on the podcast or watching the video, we want you to be able to tell us what kind of guests do you want on this show? What kind of topics and what kind of things do you want us to ask them? And make sure that you can go to the Field of View landing page, which is on a aixr.org slash field hyphen of hyphen view and you'll be able to uh, kind of ask your questions on there and subscribe for the latest episodes as well. Today we have a very interesting guest. That's right and you know what's interesting about today's kind of guest on, on the podcast is they've been in the industry since pretty much its dawn and uh, has been doing and exploring some really amazing kind of areas within it. So it's our privilege to be able to welcome kind of Elvin Graylin to our podcast today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks again for inviting me. Absolutely, absolute pleasure. Uh, in in the last few um, weeks, you had a big launch, uh, um, and uh, it's been so interesting to see all the products that HTC came out uh, to fight pandemic and to connect people. And I know that uh, it's been a quite hectic in the last few uh, weeks for you. And I know that it's difficult for you to find time to do these kind of things. So thank you so much. We are very grateful to have you on uh, on our podcast today. No, so, uh, Alvin, would you like to? St- Thank you. Would you like to start introducing yourself quickly and uh, for uh, the public that's the very few in the in the public that don't know you? <laughs> um, sure. I'm uh, Alvin Wong Graylin. I'm the uh, HTC China president, um, but I also have a few other roles that are related to the industry where I'm uh, helping uh, run the VRBCA, the Venture, uh, venture Capital, uh, Virtual Reality Venture Capital Alliance. Uh, as well as uh, vice chair for the IVRA, the Industry of VR Alliance. It's about 300 uh, different VR companies that are uh, uh, organized together to help grow the entire ecosystem. Um, and I also help to uh, run the um, Vivex uh, organization uh, for our Beijing, Shenzhen, and our Tel Aviv locations. So uh, it's uh, you know kind of a busy day. And then uh, in the last uh, few weeks, I've also been uh, asked to uh, help run the business for uh, software business for HTC uh, on a global basis. So uh, a lot of hats. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I'll be uh, keeping busy and uh, helping helping make things happen. I was going to say, it sounds like you've got, like, I, I mean, I've had a chance to take a, a little bit about you and, and see what, what's been going on in the space. And, you know, it sounds like you're kind of like a serial entrepreneur with, with all these different hats and different things that you've been doing. And I'm, I'm really, really curious to learn a little bit more about, I guess, uh, you as a person and I guess how you know how you've come to be in this position where you are being uh, uh, kind of privileged and, and able to do lots of really cool things like this I think entrepreneurship is, is kind of in my blood I've been uh, doing startups since uh, college days I actually had my first uh, startup with my college roommate and we were building PCs back in the uh, the late 80s so um, you know and uh, I've done, done four different uh, venture backed startups uh, after that and so, so I, I really enjoy the the whole technology and innovation space, uh, and you know what attracted me to HTC was really about the the startup um, kind of culture of what we were doing in terms of creating a new uh, VR business inside of HTC. So uh, you know that that really attracted me, and that was what uh, you know when I met with Cher back in 2015, and uh, you know we really shared our a common goal of how to apply. XR technology and VR technology beyond gaming, 
right? You know, she she really has a, a deep yearning to see the technology being applied to help society as a whole. And uh, that was kind of also something that I had uh, dreamed about back in the 90s when I first studied VR. So uh, we really aligned on, on that kind of a, a long-term goal, and particularly in the area of helping uh, apply VR to education. And this is super interesting. I mean, you studied VR. Would you like to give us a little bit of a background about your origin? What's the origin story of Alvin Gerlin? <laughs> uh, origin is, uh, as well, I mean, back to when I was a child or back to just when I started to, to get involved with VR? Well, I, I suppose that the origin story starts when you were a child. So why don't you <laughs> give us an overview of uh, your early days and uh, when you move. We had a conversation before this podcast. You told me that you moved to America when you were very young. And maybe it would be a very interesting for our listeners to hear uh, a little bit about your background story. Sure, sure. I think my, my background is definitely a little bit unusual for that generation. Um, so my, my parents are actually... Uh, you're Asian. So my, my dad is Chinese and my mom is um, half American, half Chinese. And so, uh, you know, and I was born during the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, actually on a re-education farm. So um, it, it's, a, it's a, I think, a pretty rare combination, particularly having um, a mom that is uh, Eurasian uh, that was, you know, living in China. So, um, you know, and, and they're both artists. So my, my dad is a uh, art professor and he was teaching uh, mm -hmm. Western art and art technique and art history for 20 years at the Guangdong Art Academy. And my mom was uh, a ballerina for the Beijing Ballet Troupe. So she was wow. uh, also one of the founders of the Shanghai and the Guangzhou Ballet School. So that's, uh, so I, I have a very artistic parents, but uh, I cannot dance and I'm not a very good painter. So <laughs> I was going to ask like if I, that artisticness <laughs> uh, kind of rubbed <laughs> off on you. <laughs> Uh, no, unfortunately, unfortunately not. But uh, my my brother got some of it because he, he he plays the guitar, the piano, and he's a pretty good dancer. So I think it it uh, it, it skipped it skipped me. <laughs> but um, so so we 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 did we yeah. So you mentioned we uh, immigrated actually. So we did immigrate from uh, China to uh, to the U.S. in in uh, 1980. So right right when China opened up. Um, of uh, you know post cultural revolution, uh, my uh, my parents was able to be kind of the first group of of people who were allowed to leave the country, and so that's uh, kind of what started me on my my uh, path towards what, what I'm doing today. And I I really have to thank my parents for giving us the opportunity to uh, to have a U.S. education and to to be able to be exposed to all the technology that I uh, otherwise would not have seen. How old were you when you moved to the U.S.? Um, I was uh, eight, turning turning nine, so uh, pretty young. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and I, I didn't speak any. I, didn't speak any I, I suppose. Yeah. I, I suppose that you were fully fluent in English, having a, a no, mom that no. was American. <laughs> no, actually, I, unfortunately not. So uh, my my mom taught my my brother English, but never taught me English. So oh, so wow, I was uh, okay. completely uh, Ill illiterate in terms of English when I when I arrived. But I learned it within a year. I was. Uh, Pretty fluent, and I learned it all from watching TV. So American TV uh, is a good way to <laughs> good way to teach a language, apparently. So. Uh, and I guess now you you know after after that you kind of got an MS in computer science at MIT, an MBA at MIT's kind of Sloan School of Management. Um, so that that must have been a an interesting progression through to that as well, then. Yeah, well, I mean, my, my parents pretty much when my uh, my brother and I arrived in the U.S., that he sat us, my dad sat us down and said, hey, look, we're artists, we don't have money. If you want to go to a good school, you need to go get some scholarships and pay for yourself. So, so you know, kind of, we were we were given a, a long-term goal, and uh, my brother and I both actually went to MIT. We both went to uh, University of Washington and uh, studied double E, so we actually had exactly the same degrees. Um, and we, we, we both did it on scholarships. So, so we, we, we tried to uh, and actually achieved the, the goal that my parents gave for us. And, you know, trying to go to a good school is, is definitely something that every uh, parent wants for their children. And particularly, I think, uh, you know, uh, Asian parents like to see their kids get into engineering. And in fact, my, my dad said, you know, you guys don't have enough art talent. So just uh, go do something that you can uh, make a contribution. On. In fact, that, that was, that's kind of what started me getting involved with, uh, with uh, technology in general is that, I, I really found the passion for technology. Um, you know, about a year or two after I got to the States, 
uh, we, my brother and I took our paper route money that, that we made to go then buy a computer. And, uh, you know, we bought an IBM XT with a green screen and we started programming and learning things and started, you know, building our own computers. And, and, and we really started to feel a passion for the ability to, to, to create something with technology. And, uh, you know, from then on, I said, okay, I, I want to be in, uh, an engineer. I, I want to, I want to use technology to help make the world better. Because my, my dad said, you know, we brought you to the United States so that you have a better chance to, to be successful, to a better chance to, to learn things and be exposed to new things. And you need to make use of this, this opportunity. And uh, you need to make a, a mark on this society and, and leave, leave, some, leave the world better than you came in for, right, came in here. And so, so I think that, that was the, the, the purpose or the goal that he, he put into my brother and I. And we... we uh, we both actually uh, tried our hardest to try to make that happen. So my, my brother is actually also a very successful entrepreneur. He's had uh, multiple uh, venture back startups and sold his last company to uh, Samsung for like $250 million or something. And uh, he's now doing another startup in uh, electric vehicles. So, so uh, you know, we're, we're, we're both uh, trying to play our part. And, and it seems that your family had a, a, a huge role in inspiring you in this sense of purpose that you've got, uh, you know, making the world a better place and using technology to make the world a better place. Uh, but you also had a lot of mentors throughout all your career and all your path. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your mentors? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, uh, in the XR perspective, I think one of my, my key mentors, advisors uh, is, uh, you know, Dr. Tom Furness. He, you know, a lot of people call him the godfather of VR and, you know, he's been in the industry since uh, 1950s, the mid 1950s. So he's been, you know, an amazing amount of time working on the XR technology and made the, the first super helmets for the Air Force and really, uh, I think, a true pioneer in, in, in this industry. Um, so I was able to take his uh, courses and, and you know, uh, study with him in the HIT lab when he joined the Human Interface Technologies Lab at the University of Washington, uh, which was the first uh, VR-oriented lab in the U.S. that was non-military, right? So um, I guess I, I was very fortunate that, you know, at the right time, at the right place, and, uh, you know, uh, I did my studies there and, and really uh, focused on applying VR, uh, VR to education. And I remember at the time I was predicting that within 10 years, everybody will be using VR to educate. The schools are going to be amazing, right? And, uh, you know, 10 years later, you know, VR was like nobody heard of VR. So, <laughs> um, but, but I, I, I think now, you know, something, you know, 28, 29 years later, I think we're, we're, we're really at a point where uh, VR and XR in general, I think, is going to be disrupting almost every aspect of our lives. You know uh, everything from from education to to work to you know events to travel you know uh, almost everything that we will do will be somehow uh, improved or made more productive uh, made more interesting uh, because of xr so so i'm i'm a, I'm a real believer uh, i think uh, the time uh, now is is probably uh, you know uh, the, the the right way that's going to happen, and this time I think it's going to continue to happen. And a lot of it is actually because uh, things have been accelerated because of what's happened this year. You know, with with the pandemic, uh, it, it certainly has brought a lot of negative impact to society as a whole. Uh, but for the industry, I think it actually will have a lot of long term positive impact in terms of of getting people to accept digitalization of life. You know, um, if you think about it, uh, you know, trying to get people to put something on their head to, to, you know, live their entire life, I think it's a very, very big change in what they're doing today, which is looking at a screen or looking at something on their hands, right? But now that we've already gotten everybody used to, okay, instead of meeting somebody, instead of going somewhere, instead of taking a plane, we could just have a digital device that, that, that brings us together. And we've accepted that. I mean, we're doing it right now. Right. And this is this is the primary mode of operation of, of connectivity for people today is using these video conferences. So, you know, it's only a small step from that to using a, a more 3D uh, immersive experience, whether on your PC or on your phone or on your uh, headset, but in a 3D space instead of a video space. So we're in a very video first um, kind of interaction model. Now we need to get people to a spatial first um, uh, you know, working model. I think that that's what's happening. In fact, um, 
at the XR Suite launch we had a few weeks ago. Uh, one of the videos I showed was a video that when I was at Intel in, in 1997 or 98, it was uh, a video of Jason Alexander uh, from uh, Seinfeld who was doing an advertising, a 30 second advertising about video conferencing. Right? And this was back you know, 23 years ago. And you know that technology isn't very different than, than what we're doing today. I mean, if you showed the, the video to somebody with, and you didn't show the first part and the last part, you would think, okay, it's something that's you know maybe a few years old, but it's not 23 years old, right? But if you think it's taken that long for video adoption, video conferencing adoption to really happen, I mean, you know, there's been off and on some niche usage of video conferencing, but not like now. Like now, it's everybody's using it. So. Now that everybody's using digitalization of communication, now we just need to get people to to uh, to get to that next step. So I'm I'm very very optimistic uh, about what's going to happen as the next normal going beyond video. I mean, you are very optimistic about the future, but of course there are surely some problems in the technology adoption for mass markets that's held back the technology until now. I was going to say that's that's kind of like what I was going to touch on as well because I I know that. You know, you you specialize in VR and AI, uh, kind of at uh, kind of university and with, with electrical engineering. So it was kind of for me interesting to see the the stark differences as well between you know 1991 and and kind of today as well. Oh yeah, if you could give it like a little bit of a timeline, and then we can arrive to today. That would be great. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I mean, the the devices we're using actually, if you if you go back to kind of the like 2015 it didn't look that different than those devices. I mean, it's kind of a, a box and it's had wires and you know, a few wires and instead of using a controller, it was using a glove, you know. So uh, and it, it was actually still, it was fixed off and we could move around. So in a, in a way, um, and the field of view was, was okay. I mean, it was like, it was probably close to a hundred degrees. It was, the, the pixels were really bad. I think it was you know, maybe like a 300 by 300 or something in you know, resolution. Um, uh, but, you know, you would recognize it as a VR device, right? Um, but I, I think in another few years, we will not recognize the devices. I mean, you look at it and say, is that a, you know, you won't, you won't say that that's the same, same type of a device, you know? So, so I, I think over the last five years, the XR industry has probably progressed more than the 20 years before that uh, in terms of, of technology uh, innovation, right? So. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, Nick was asking, like, you know, what, what's, what's kept it from going? Uh, I think it was, uh, one of the key things that it didn't, you know, it didn't take off back in the 2000 you know, or the 1990s is, is that the cost was just, just way, way higher. Right? I mean, devices we were using were several hundred thousand dollars and, you know, connected to a silicon graphics workstation. You know, it just um, nobody, there's no way for consumers to buy that. Right. But over the last 20 years, the technology uh, of what's created the smartphones has actually been now can be applied to uh, to XR devices. And so, you know, the scale of what's what's happened in, in the, you know, in the uh, in the smartphone industry has really, really helped to bring the cost down and bring the performance way up. Right. So you have, you know, these super high resolution micro displays that can, you know, get get you amazing graphics on dual, you know, on dual screens and, and being able to have a, 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 a you know, SOC chip that is, you know, probably better than, than maybe some of the, 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 the workstations that were at the time, right? So it, it's just, it's crazy how, how much technology has, has developed. You know? So I think that that's really one of the, the key factors. And, you know, the other thing that I think, um, you know, why, why hasn't VR really taken off in the last few years or as much as, as, as uh, maybe people had hoped? I think one thing is that I think people were just expecting too much. You know, people, uh, the, the, the hype engine of XR in 2015 and 16 was just so loud that everybody was like, wow, look at this thing. It's, you know, it's going to, everybody next year is going to be using this thing. And, and I think it was just we, we as an industry probably um, didn't, didn't set a proper expectation. Go so ahead. do you think that the Hollywood industry ruined a little bit and spoiled the dream of VR? 
because at that time in the mid 80s there were all those movies like the lawnmower man or johnny mnemonic that were promising this vr the cyberspace and the cyber gloves and at the end of the day vr was literally 300 by 300 screens with pixelated images and very limited interaction and 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 the people got uh, bored and fed up about waiting for this dream of a full immersive vr where people could touch each other and so on do you think that the expectation was too high at the time um yeah i mean i i think you know the the expectation was high because you know people went waiting such a long time right and i think a lot of people just didn't realize that from the 1990s to probably like 2015 there was relatively little progress in in that industry because people kind of moved on to doing other things and then it got hot again in kind of the 2014 15 16 period and so then the progress started again Right. So, so I think we have to actually give a lot of credit to, to Palmer Lucky and, and you know, John Carmack and those guys at, at, at Oculus to, to bring VR back into the forefront of people's awareness. Right? And, and the fact that they were purchased by, by Facebook really then brought a lot of VCs to say, oh, you know, this is an industry that's going to get hot, start investing and probably over investing in, in, in some companies. So, and, um, were, you, were you already yeah. at HTC at that time when uh, uh, Carmack started working on? Uh, I I, on I was not, I was not, but uh, I was actually uh, doing my own startup, and I I, I was I was uh, at the end, kind of in 2015 was when I actually sold my company and and started being. I was approached by by HTC to to uh, to uh, look at an opportunity with HTC. So so I think the timing was actually quite good. I I, I was re-exposed to uh, the DK1 and. You know that was what got me excited again about about uh, XR and made me interested to go and and uh, speak with uh, with HTC. So um, in fact, there was a friend at Microsoft who then who showed me the DK1 and I tried on the the, the Tuscan experience and I was like, oh, this is cool. This is so much better than what I had back in the 90s. And uh, you know, it, it was still three DOS. I remember. So it, it wasn't great, um, but it, it was it was already pretty good, and you know it wasn't the high def version yet. It was in the DK2, but you know I, I was already quite impressed. Did when you when you put that on, did you think it was like? Did you at that point um, did you think that the VR industry could actually now have the potential to take off, or did you think it would be kind of similar to where you were in in, in the nineties? No, no. So I, I I actually at that point thought okay. It, it's time again. This is the time, right? Because I, I sort of gave up on it in the 90s because it just, it just wasn't ready, right? And, you know, I, I had high hopes and, and the, the industry just, just didn't really um, solidify. It, it, you know, it just wasn't the right time, right? Uh, there, was, there was a lot more infrastructural uh, technology that needed to be built up, and, and it was been built up over the last 20 years. So, so at 2014, 15, I realized... Um, that you know the, the the mobile industry actually has done a lot of the base work, and so I knew at this time I think it, it, it is possible for it to realize what I had predicted 20 years ago. <laughs> so so uh, so I, I was uh, very excited. In fact, uh, back in 2014, I, I had my startup was doing AR related work, but on phones. So we were doing location based uh, AR visualization and. Um, <clears throat> You know, you can look at any location and it would point out to you kind of the closest restaurants or the closest bars and, and you'll be able to see things uh, wow. on a phone. So it was mixing together AR with location-based services. Right. So, and which um, year was this one? This was 2014. Yeah, 2014. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, not, so f- um, not so far away. <clears throat> yeah, 2013 maybe? 13, I think. Yeah. So, um, right. so Nick, I, it I would, sounds like it's not yeah. that far away, but then you actually realize that we're shooting this in 2020 at the moment. It's going to be 2021 soon. <laughs> and then you're like, you have a, existed, <laughs> a crisis on your hand. <laughs> Looking back. You know, this, was, this is what happens when you're over 40, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a time, time goes at different scales. So, yeah, the younger you are, so you're, Daniel, you're, you're lucky that you, uh, I think you uh, have a different perspective on time. But I, I, uh, I agree, Nick. <laughs> So, I mean, obviously, like, so, so you've, you've made your way up to kind of HTC and doing this amazing stuff there, but there's obviously this period in between as well, I guess, where um, I, I, I hope that there's some stuff there that probably armed you to be able to be at your very best now what you do. And I know you mentioned some different startups and things, but I also heard that you kind of worked at, at kind of IBM as well. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I was actually well, that was a long time ago. That was uh, also in the '90s. I was uh, working on the the what became the Power PC chip. So I, I was studying computer architecture and and uh, worked in their, their their new chip design team. Uh, so it was it was a pretty pretty interesting. I, and I, I was working to uh, in in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. So it was a oh, wow. very uh, okay. cold no, place. The well. only thing there was there was the Mayo Clinic and IBM. So <laughs> <laughs> and it was a it was a fun fun group and super smart people. Uh, you know, it was, it was a base where the AS four hundred was uh, created. So, uh, you know, I think Nick Nick, uh, you you used to be an IBM. Yeah, I'm an ex IBMer, so I can relate. I've been uh, I've been in that area and uh, I've I've seen the research and f- research facilities. So yeah, at that time must have been like pretty exciting working for that company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there was this was still when the uh, the mini computer that AS four hundred was. Uh, the group that I was kind of part of was uh, maybe 5,000 people, but it you know, essentially created 30% or 40% of the profitability of the company or something. So uh, a yeah. very high, high productive uh, group. Um, and you know, and yeah, at that time, so there it, was it, it also was the power PC processor that was coming yeah. out and uh, mm-hmm. Apple was using the processors and uh, many other uh, companies started using that processor. I, I think that's uh, uh, the... Um, Xbox 360 was using the power PC as well. So, I mean, it's been used by Apple computers, by co- video game consoles and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they're, uh, they, it, was, it was a very good chip. And, uh, you know, so after that, I actually moved uh, to Intel and uh, worked in there, uh, actually helped, uh, helped engineer or, or architect the, uh, the MMX-related uh, Pentium. So that was Ooh, uh, working that. on it, the, the instruction set for, for MMX. Uh, the, the multimedia, multimedia instructions. Media extension. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Media extensions, so, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So, uh, so it's kind of the new instruction set, the, the, the kind of multi-data set uh, specific uh, instruction sets. So to, to allow for video processing and, and you know, all, the, all the audio and all these other things that, that were, at the time, very high-tech uh, in computing. So. And, and, and you, work, you work for IBM and you work for uh, Intel. Uh, but now I saw during the presentation that you had a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, now you're partnering with AMD for uh, your HTC launch. Uh, what do you think about this competition between uh, uh, AMD and uh, uh, Intel? But also there's this new uh, ca- camera in the in the game of uh, uh, integrated system chips that is NVIDIA that recently bought ARM. Uh, do you think that is healthy to have this uh, competition, this ecosystem of choice? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, in, Intel has been a dominant force in the computing space for decades, right? I mean, since essentially since the 80s, right? And my, my first PC that was uh, built on, a, I think, an 8080 or 8086. So, <laughs> um, you know, and, and really since then, they, they've been leading. I remember when I was there, uh, you know, AMD was around 10% market share. And I remember we specifically wanted to keep them alive and help them so that uh, it, there wouldn't be an antitrust issue uh, of having too much of a dominance of the marketplace. Um, but I think AMD over the last few years has, has done an amazing job. I mean, uh, you know, they are, they're now, uh, you know, have the, the fastest processors uh, for, for PCs out there. So they're, you know, they're uh, doing a very good job and, you know, also very uh, high performing uh, video processors. So uh, you have to give them credit. Uh, they, they've, uh, They've really, I think, bypassed or surpassed uh, Intel from that uh, that perspective. And in, in, Intel, after the Andy Grove days, have uh, not been the same. So uh, I remember doing, uh, you know, design reviews or or, or, uh, or quarterly, yearly reviews with Andy Grove, and that guy was sharp. You know, he, he would a year later he would remember what he told you, what he asked you, and he's like, I remember last year I asked you this. Did you guys do it? <laughs> and so wow. so you know and. You know, this, this, yeah, and he, he would, you know, in a, in a two-hour meeting, he would know exactly what, what points to ask for. Uh, and I, I, I've been I've very, very impressed with, uh, with him as a leader, right? Um, so so I, I think that, that the company really has not been able to, uh, to drive that same level of, of industry and innovation as when he was, uh, when he was at the helm. So... But, uh, you know, I think it's, competition is always good for the world, right? Because the more competition, the prices go down, people innovate faster, it, 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 things go, go in circles. So, 
I, I, uh, I, you know, they're still a big company. There's still a lot of smart people there. I've, I still have friends there. So, um, you know, um, I think it's also interesting that, that NVIDIA is now getting into the, the computing business and you have Qualcomm also uh, doing quite well in the, uh, the, the SOC uh, business as well. So, um, you know, I think Intel missed out on the mobile chip uh, you know, perspective. So that, that was uh, probably one of the areas they, they could have done, done more in. Um, but uh, I think, you know, computing will, will always be, uh, will, will at least not always, but at least for the, for the, the foreseeable future will be a very important part of the technology industry because they are, you know, the, the core utility, right? The ability to, to, to process information is, uh, is key to, to the long-term success of, of essentially the world that we live in today. And the, especially in the future, kind of a very digital centric world that we're going to be living in. And uh, going fast forward in the um, in the future after your Intel days, um, you join HTC in a pivotal moment where they decided to enter the VR space. Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the first Vive, the Vive Pre? I own the Vive Pre, and uh, I have to say that when I received the box, I was so excited, and I still using uh, lighthouses in my house, the tracking and so on. And you worked with Vive uh, in order to, to with Vive, sorry, with Valve in order to design and create the headsets. Can you give us a little bit of an insight about that process in those days? Yeah, well, um, I mean, the, the, the pre was actually, I, I came right after the pre was very released, so I can't really speak too much about the development of the pre. Um, but, you know, there was kind of the first generation and the second generation pre as well. So, but the, the initial dev kits was, was definitely a, a lot of uh, kind of uh, deep cooperation between our team and the, uh, and the Valve team to, to make it happen. So, you know, the, 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 the Lighthouse technology, was definitely a, a core piece of what made Vive and Valve successful, you know, the Vive product successful, the ability to do the whole room scale. You know, when, when at that time, uh, you know, the other devices were, were really still just sitting down, right? You're just kind of sitting down on a, a very uh, limited number, uh, limited uh, interaction model. And, you know, when, 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 the Valve, when the Vive had actually two hands, you know, Oculus was still using a Xbox controller, right? So, so I think the uh, it, it it really brought the ability for people to feel that VR was was here, right? Because it, it lets you realize the whole holotech dream that people have been having. If you're a Star Trek fan, I mean, you know, being able to walk into a room and then be anywhere, right? I remember the. Uh, you're, you're talking about the, the 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 blue and whatever. You know, the, the, to be able to 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 go and be underwater or be on Mars, to be able to to use the 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 tilt brush and be able to paint something, that allow people to to see. Okay, this is now possible. You know, all the things that we've been talking about for for the last you know decades is now possible. Um, but you know, it's for it to really get to you know, a full wireless for it to be get to, you know, without needing to have a, a big PC around for it to be able to get to, you know, uh, uh, naked eye type of, of resolution, there's still time, right? But, but we've, we've moved so far over the last five years. I think, you know, again, I have to say, I think in the last five years, we've progressed more in this industry than we have in the last 20. And probably in the next two to five years, we're going to progress more than, you know, than well, actually we'll probably in the next two or three years, we'll probably progress more than we have in the last five or the last 25 years. So, so I think you'll, you'll, you'll see some really amazing things coming out in the next uh, two, three years that I think will, will really um, make the, the dream of kind of mass adoption for VR possible. So, or XR in general, not, not just VR, but XR. When you when you had to launch Vive, I guess, what what was it like behind the scenes? Was were, were you nervous? Were you worried about like how how were you like um, expecting like reception of it and things like that? Like what was it like behind the scenes? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was uh, definitely exciting days for all of us, and I, I don't think we were nervous. I don't think we were worried about uh, about the reception because there was just so much positive press and, and buzz, right? Maybe it was a little too much. I think, I think in a way, it, it actually made us believe that things would happen faster, right? I mean, I think we, we actually drank our own Kool-Aid in a way 
Um, not necessarily in a bad way. I, I think you know every startup, every everybody who's innovating, you have to believe in what you're doing for you to do something amazing, to you to, to break break through the prior limitations, right? So, so I think it, it, um, you know everybody was so excited uh, when we when we were doing it. And remember, um, you know, for when we launched in China, we actually delivered the the device to uh, Yao Ming as our first first user. I think he might have actually even been the first user globally uh, to to use our product. So we actually went to his house. I you know because I I I, uh, I knew him or I, I had friends who knew him, and so we actually set up to say, can we come to your house and you can be the first user? And he's like, all right, sure, come on over. So that was that was pretty exciting to be able to hand deliver. Uh, the first vibe, go to his house, set it all up, and then he's playing it. His his daughter's playing it, you know. And uh, to to have him open the door and have this giant come, you know, uh, it was it was definitely uh, an interesting uh, interesting experience. Um, what was his, his uh, takeaway? <laughs> yeah, that's what we wanted. To know. <laughs> what, what was his what? His I, feedback. I what a, yeah. Oh, his no, no. He 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 loved it. You know, he he's a gamer. I, I don't know if you guys know, but he he's. Uh, He's, he's like, uh, I guess he was a World of Warcraft gamer when he was playing the NBA. You know, yeah. Kind of all his off time, it was, he was just gaming, right? So uh, he, he actually showed me his, his gaming setup at home. And, you know, he, so he, he's a hardcore, hardcore gamer. Um, so when, when he got in there and really saw all the possible, he, he, he got quite excited. And in fact, even, even uh, just last year, we were working with the uh, CBA uh, to do um, basketball training. For, for young kids uh, to uh, get them prepared for the, the, the professional league. So, so their, their training camps were using VR. And we were, we were seeing that you, by, by supplementing their normal offline training practice with VR, it actually improved their shooting percentages and it also improved their, uh, their uh, confidence. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it's actually kind of, it's, it's good that you know, a few years later, that the the CBA actually is working with using VR to uh, to uh, help their players. I'm I'm interested as well. Like, so this is a question that I get asked by academy members kind of all the time, which is um, the the differences between I guess the kind of uh, kind of Chinese market and kind of you know North American and kind of kind of European markets, because I think. There's obviously a kind of big differences in, in the approach of, of the go-to-market strategies in those regions, and um, I'm just just interested to get your take on on the differences and the, the nuances between them as well. Um, I mean, I, I I guess you know go-to-market. Uh, it's a <laughs> it's a very big question, right? But you know what what I think what we've done a little bit differently than some of the other uh, players is that we really from the start uh, looked at it as an ecosystem play. I, um, I think uh, HCC uh, at one point, I don't know if you're aware, but we, we were the number one uh, phone manufacturer in the world, number one smartphone manufacturer in the world right, back in the 2010, 11, 12 time period. Um, and the, you know, the, first, the first Windows phone, the first Android phone, the first touchscreen phone, you know, the, the, all about innovation and hardware. Um, but you know, kind of after the 2012, it started to go downhill. And, what, what the company realized is that you know, by being just a hardware manufacturer alone, you can't stay as a, a market leader. Right? So I think so when, when, when uh, you know, Share decided to get into the, the VR space, uh, she really made that a, an important part of the strategy was to say, hey, we're not just going to be a hardware manufacturer. You know, we're, we're also going to uh, make the, the, the store. And we're going to try to create an, an, an ecosystem that, that, that surrounds it. And uh, you know, when I when I got there, we started talking about how can we invest in, in startups. And so that's why we we created the Vivex program because we wanted to to see how how can we let startups be part of that solution and and help them when they need it most. You know, being that I, I was I was also a, you know been in the startup side, I know how much value it can be to have a. a a uh, market leader be your supporter because it's so hard for small companies to get attention, right? So we're talking so, uh, about Chair Wang, which is the uh, the HTC uh, chairwoman that uh, to, the, to this year has been appointed with the Accenture Lifetime Achievement Award for VR. Uh, so uh, for everyone that is watching this uh, podcast, you can uh, go and revisit the VR award ceremony. Uh, Chair has been appointed with uh, this award from Accenture and from uh, AIXR. 
Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Nick. That was, I think, a real, real honor for uh, for her and for ACC to, uh, you know, to be given that award by uh, by Accenture and then the the uh, you know uh, VR awards and AIXR uh, group. Uh, you know, I, I think she she definitely deserves uh, that kind of a recognition because because she she is somebody that I think is uh, is doing it. She, she's working in VR and doing all these investments in VR to help the industry and to help the world, right? Not not really as a purely a profit-driven motive. You know, I, I know, you know, a lot of companies are really just about, you know, how can we grow the market and how can we capture the customer? How how can we, you know, get maximum dollars out of this? And what she always talks to us about is, you know, how, how can this technology help people? You know, how can it be applied in the real world? You know, how, how can this create more equality? How, you know, all of, the, all of those aspects of, of, of really helping humanity with technology. And, and you invested something like a hundred million dollars in startups. Yeah, so, so we, we've uh, invested in, I think now probably over 110 companies. Uh, the, the exact amount I, I, I actually, uh, I'm not allowed to disclose, but, but we're, we, we, I think we were or are the most active investor in the XR industry, right? Uh, and a lot of these companies are are my friends still, and, and we we talk regularly. We have a chat group that you know all these companies are, are in this group, and we we try, try to help each other. And I think that's really what what uh, makes me the most gratified is that I see these companies working together and they're solving problems for each other with each other, right? So it's not about we're investing and then they're just separate companies. They actually now are one community, and having them work and help each other. Uh, that that's what's uh, kind of amazing, and a lot of our companies that we invest in also help some of our competitors. You know, they're they're making you know haptic devices for our competitors, or they're making eye tracking devices for uh, our competitors, or they're making you know uh, wireless devices uh, adapters for our competitors, and so forth. So so I think that's that's our attitude is that you know whatever we do, it's not about making ACC successful. It's really about making the industry successful. Because we know that in the long run, if the industry is successful, you know, we'll we'll have our place in the industry, you know? and and you know, as a, as as a, a market leader, we need to be the ones investing and helping the industry, uh, not about you know trying to take uh, from the industry or, or take from the market at this point because it is just too early in, in the process. So I mean, I'm interested with that as well. I mean, what of what makes a XR startup investable, kind of in, in your mind? Um, I, I think what makes an XR startup investable is what makes any startup investable is you got to have a, a, a founders and a team that that really know what they're doing, right? And and have the right attitude and and really have a a long term view. You know, uh, I think during the 2000 and you know probably in the last three four years, I probably met with uh, I don't know several thousand companies, right? So it, it's um, and 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 immediately you can tell. Which are the ones who uh, who are just in it for kind of a quick quick win, and maybe want to flip it and you know try to try to get it while it's hot, and then which are the ones who really want to do something amazing and, and create you know change and 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 build something that people haven't done before, right? And solving real problems. So so by by uh, by spending some time with with the founders, I think very quickly you you get to see. You know, are these do these guys have the right attitude and the right mindset and the right perseverance to be a successful entrepreneur in general, and then to be able to be successful in this industry uh, specifically? Right? So, um, but but I, I think the other thing is after the founder is really you know are they trying to solve a real problem? Is that problem something that people are going to pay for? Right? Because there's a lot of people who said, oh, I've got this really cool technology. You know, people are going to love it because this technology does something. But like, so what are you trying to solve with it? What can it do? You know, how can people use it? And and is it five percent better, ten percent better, or is it you know five x or ten x better? Right. So so I, I think that a lot of times, um, you know, people people get enamored by a cool technology, but they they're maybe sometimes either too early or maybe uh, it's not as amazing as they thought because they actually didn't do the research and there's like five companies that can do what they do. <laughs> which which has happened a few times. We're like, they're like, oh, I, would, I think it's so cool. Like, well, have you looked at this? They're like, what? Ah, and then you're like, uh, okay, maybe you should t- look at that, and then we can talk again afterwards. So, um, but but also coachability. I think that's also something that really, if you want to invest in somebody, they have to be willing to listen. They have to have some level of humility that that they can listen and adapt and change based on what what they what the reality is, what they learn. 
right? Being willing to learn um, is really a, a key to, to success, I think, uh, of, of any entrepreneur, right? So, um, but, you know, th there's a lot of other things like, you know, business model and so forth. But, but I think, you know, uh, at, at this point, if you can get those two, first few things right, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a long ways uh, in there. And then, and then, you know, you'll work with all these entrepreneurs to, to really uh, adapt and, and probably, you know, slight pivots because at the end of the day, very few companies end up doing exactly what their original business plan uh, are. So, so um, and, and a lot of things in, in financial models and, you know, those, we all know that the, everybody's curve looks like this, right? Um, but most people's curves are like this and then maybe at the end they go like this. So, um, you know, having the patience, you know, having, uh, having the maturity to understand what's, what's really possible instead of what's, what the dream, having a dream that, that uh, is not possible and then they'll get totally disappointed and they'll disappoint their team. You know, so, so having some leadership ability to, to really communicate properly. and Yeah, because and, uh, that's, that's one of yeah. the fears that when I speak to some startups as well, they say that, you know, when you, they speak to a typical VC, the typical VC is looking at how to, you know, make their exit within the next kind of, you know, five years or, or, or less. Um, and I guess the approach is, has to be slightly different for, for the XR market at the moment as well. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's also a little bit different from a, a financial investor versus a strategic in, in fact, investor perspective, right? As a financial investor, you really have very little influence on the success of the company, right? except giving them money. Uh, and, and you have a very uh, tight window of the, the lifetime of that fund, so which is usually five to seven years. So, so um, I, you can't blame VCs for having that type of a timeline. Uh, as a strategic investor, we, we, we have the benefit of saying, hey, not only can you, we give you some money, but you know what, if you need to go to market, if you want to take the technology and apply it in a device, if you want to meet customers, we know who, your, who the customers are. We know what the users want. You know, we have a device that can take this. We can bundle it with you. We can, put this in, we can highlight this in our feature in our store. You know, we can help you become aware, uh, have people be aware of you, right, and have customers be aware of you. And so, so I think we take a, a slightly different perspective in terms of uh, the kind of companies that we're willing to take a risk on uh, versus maybe um, financial investors that maybe overly get enamored by some things and, and have uh, maybe a little higher urge, sense of urgency in terms of wanting immediate traction. And right now, you've been talking about pivoting and you've been talking about, uh, uh, you know, being able to adapt to the different kind of needs of people, uh, create user centric products, uh, products that will really solve a, a, a problem of their users is absolutely key for success. And now HTC is moving towards uh, the software business. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in HTC? I mean, you're moving from a hardware to a venture capitalist and, and then now you you have this software ecosystem that you launched recently. Yeah, so I mean, I think we, you know, we, we talked earlier about having the whole you know ecosystem approach, and and you know, we, you know, hardware uh, platform, uh, entire ecosystem investments, as well as actually working with a lot of our hardware partners. We we had the Vive Wave program. I don't know if you're aware of that, but we've been helping standalone device manufacturers around the world uh, accelerate their ability to go to market by giving them SDK, giving them. Uh, hardware accessories, you know, giving them base technology as well as the content stores so that they can have a device they can sell actually at a cheaper price than what we sell uh, so, that, so that we can reach a bigger market. Right? Um, but you know, what, one of the things that I, I, I think we found over the last year or two is that you know, even though the hardware is developing fairly consistently, we still, would, we still need some uh, killer apps essentially, that are daily use apps, that are not just games, right? I think, you know, there's some amazing games that are being built all the time and are coming this year, you know, like Half-Life Alex was, was great. I spent 20 hours in there and I, I loved it, right? But after that 20 hours, I'm done. I, I don't need to play it again, right? What we need now for this industry to really grow up and to be adopted on a wide scale is having something that I want to go back to every day. And I think the things that we would use VR on every day are the things that we already do every day. I think that, that's, that's the, the key is that in the past, people were thinking, oh, what game is going to be the killer app? I don't think it will actually be a game. I think it will be uh, our ability to communicate. 
It will be our ability to go to work, our ability to go to school, our ability to attend a conference, our ability to do, you know, travel, our ability to socialize with each other, right? Those are the things that we do every day today already, but now we can do it in a digital form, in a spatial form, instead of a video form or instead of a physical form, right? So I think that that's the the idea of what, you know, what drove the creation of the XR suite. Um, you know, back in the back in March or you know February when the, the pandemic really kept everybody you know locked down. I mean, China was the first place in the world to get locked down, right? So, you know, I remember not going into the office for for several months, and and we were like, you know, how can we use technology to really help solve this problem? And so, you know, uh, I started coming up with the concept of how can we create find the tools that are out there today that we can use integrate them together into a suite that really solves various types of life problems that we're going to have because the pandemic is not going to go away. Right? It is something that, that will be part of our lives for at least the next year or two or maybe longer. And, and, and you know, essentially the things that we had predicted, I remember in March we had our first uh, ecosystem conference in the Engage product, uh, which is now our Vive Sessions product. Right? So, uh, and I remember in that, in that uh, in my speech there, I said, look, you know, this is China now, but very soon the rest of the world is going to be like this. You guys need really to prepare for it. You know, the, the, the normal we know is not going to be here anymore. You guys need to realize that, that the pandemic is going to change the way that we live. And I think over the last uh, six, seven, eight months, it's really played out pretty much uh, kind of what we've expected. And, then, you know, a lot of part of the world is still locked down, right? China is in a way uh, very fortunate that it's mostly... Uh, in a lot of ways, back to normal, right? And where I'm back in the office every day, I'm starting to fly again. You know, people are going to restaurants. They're actually having concerts, and you know, people are going to cinemas. So, so there, it's not 100% back, but it's still a lot of it is back. Right? But the only thing that's missing now is international travel. You cannot travel internationally. But you know, a lot of the domestic pieces of it is already there. So, but what we found is that what you know. People have, have changed their, their attitude, though. Even, even now they can travel, they're still traveling a lot less than they used to, even domestically. Even though they could meet face-to-face, -face, they're still deciding, let's just do a conference, video conference instead, even if we're in the same city, right? Even though I can come to your office. But, so, so what we're finding is that now, how can we make that process better? Because you know, the whole concept of Zoom fatigue it's, it's a real thing, and, and people get tired. I, I, when I look at a screen all day, you know, 10 hours a day, looking at somebody's face, it's okay when there's two or three people, but when it's 20 or 30 people, it is very tiring, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of stressful, right? And, and uh, the, the, the productivity of it is actually limited. So, so what we found is that we started to, to see how can we take tools to help solve this problem, and not only to solve the problem of workers trying to do this, but to solve the problems of the billion students who are doing this, right? I mean, I still have uh, my daughter in the U.S. right now is still going to school on video. And, and you know, the, and she's complaining about how in, unproductive it is, right? And how she's not learning enough and how she has to do all her own research and how she can't see her friends and they can't do good group sessions anymore. You know, that's the kind of things that, that, that people miss is the ability to have that camaraderie, the, the, the ability to build the friendships and the, 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 team, the team collaborative activities. You know. But those are the things that are very, very natural in a VR, XR environment. Right? So this, this was what, what uh, drove the impetus for creating the XR suite. And so pretty much from March till last month, you know, I, I worked with uh, five different uh, um, software vendors around the world, actually one, four outside ones and one internal team to create the XR suite. Uh, which allows us now to do, you know, remote work, remote school, remote concerts, and remote conferences, and remote, you know, museum and fashion tours and, and, and film festivals. Essentially, all the aspects of life that we've been deprived of because of the pandemic can now be duplicated in a virtual world. But the one big difference, I think, of what we're doing now than what's been happening in the last few years is that XR industry in the past has really focused on creating software for XR devices. But the focus for us this time is how can we make sure that XR devices have a great experience, but every single device that people already have, PCs, laptops, uh, tablets, phones, 
can all join into a spatial environment with these XR devices so that they can collaborate together and feel that sense of connection, right? This, this is why we've chosen the partners that we have. This, this is why, you know, we, we've really uh, forced, our, maybe not forced, we've, we've uh, led our, all these partners to make sure they have as many of these platforms covered as possible, right? And then I think that, that's what's needed. And then to, to then make it as easy as possible for people to sign up so they can use a single account to log on to all of these apps. They can learn one interface and know how to use everything. You know, they can get one account and be able to, 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 to interface with people around the world, no matter if they're behind firewall of China or not, you know, so that they can have high performance no matter where they go, so that they can have group management, so that if you're a large corporation that has a thousand users, you can manage them centrally. You know, to, to, these are the things that wasn't really a, a, a key requirement before because they were just small companies servicing small customers, right? If we, if we want it now to be used by large corporations everywhere in the world or large schools everywhere in the world, then, then those are the problems that we need to fix. Well, you know what's what we've interesting doing. as well is like, so obviously like with this year as well with the VR awards, um, we had to uh, very, very quickly turn around and figure out how do we take this event, which is usually this red carpet gala, you know, event in, in central London uh, with about 300 people who usually fly in from all over the world. How do we take that and, and take it to something virtual? And what was really interesting is we had a conversation within our team. And uh, I think, Nick, you were in, in that conversation as well. Um, we had we put together kind of a board of, of people who who understand the industry and, and essentially we, we asked this question what should a virtual event look like and the most interesting thing that we decided and and changed was we could have put the the vr awards just into a virtual environment but we wanted to figure out how do we take this virtual environment and create it into the vr awards rather than the other way around because the, the most interesting thing to me in particular and i'm not sure what everyone else's view is but VR and, and XR as well opens this opportunity to do things that you can never do in the real world, right? So it's like the approach of the VR was this year is we could have just done a ceremony, right, on a stage and, and announce all the winners and people come up to the stage and talk. But instead, um, part of the experience was you go into the VR awards and you are led through this narrative story driven experience where we announce the winners and people have their finalist stuff videos are shown and people are talking but it's an experience that you're led through so I, I'm really interested as well to see the, the future of the events market as well because I think that the events can be approached and digital things can be approached in completely different ways to how we approach things in the real world as well I, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more but, but I think we could do more Right, because if you look at what what we try to do with the uh, our our last several events, whether it's the, the the ecosystem event, it was completely in VR. There was you know panels of people in VR, and people were attending from 50 plus countries in VR. Right, uh, about 20 percent of them were attending on PCs, but 80 percent of them were were in in VR devices, and. You know, we actually had multilingual tracks. We had special effects. We had, you know, rockets flying out and, and whales flying around. And, you know, we create a special venue for people to, to go in that they, that's not possible in the physical world. Right? In, the, in the last, you know, at our XR suite launch uh, a few weeks ago, you know, we had flying pods that were flying in the air when they launched and then allowing people to teleport when they walk through these pods into each of the apps so that they can experience what it's like inside the apps, you know, when during our, our June um, uh, industry event, I remember it was uh, the week after the SpaceX launch uh, that was the first successful kind of NASA cooperation SpaceX launch. And I, I, we created a, a model of the Falcon 9 rocket uh, that they had, and we gave everybody uh, the, the SpaceX suits. You know, so, so those were the kind of experiences that allow people to, to really immerse themselves into that experience and feel like they've gone somewhere, they've done something, they've seen something that is actually not possible in the real world. So I, I, I would like to see next year if we're doing this that, you know, it's good to have some, some video components and we, we, we've had small video components into, in, in all our events. But the, the main environment is actually a spatial environment that people can walk through. Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. And, and Nick, you'll know the pain that we had as well with the, the awards this year where we literally asked all 150 finalists to provide us a 3D asset from their experience to put into the awards. 
<laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was difficult. That was painful, but in the end, we made it. And uh, I uh, I hope that the people that uh, experienced the VR awards this year in VR will f- find it like as compelling as we believe it is, and as different we believe it is. Uh, you mentioned something very interesting, Alvin, uh, and uh, even you, Daniel, when you were talking about the value of creating an experience that is not just a representation of the physical reality, but is also taking full advantage of the medium, which is basically uh, a staple of every transformational experience that we, 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 we had from technology in the last 20 years. Think about mobile phones, think about any other uh, technological innovation that happened in the last 20 years. So taking full advantage of the technology, not just replicate what that was before. Uh, and one of the things that I believe that people um, are not understanding yet is the fact that we don't want to replace uh, the physical uh, events and the, the human interaction, the, the normal human interaction, is an augmentation, is an extension. Right now we're having more conversation, for example, with WhatsApp, with our friends, because we can contact them directly via mobile phone. But in the future, for example, we will be able to have more f- human interactions with our friends because in the future we'll be able to be uh, in VR with them in a virtual physical space and we'll be able to have this kind of human contact that is missing right now with uh, video chat and with normal chats and the same thing for events Uh, a lot of companies right now are worried about uh, the the, the live stream business that uh, uh, is taking over the world because of the pandemics to cannibalize the physical experience but in the future and I think that we discussed about the new, the, the next new normal uh, with you, Alvin. Uh, there will be a, a parallelism between the physical events and the virtual events. So companies will be able to reach more audience using digital platforming and unlock new uh, businesses and new ways of monetizing their content using this kind of technology. What do you think? Uh, about uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, in our June event, we had a hi- hybrid event. The first hybrid event, we had about four or 500 people uh, in Shanghai. And then we had several thousand people online joining the same event. We even had demo booths that looked like the demo booths that we had offline so that people can go and talk to the, people, talk to the representatives from each of those companies. Right? So, so I think creating a digital twin of, of these hybrid events will be very uh, common practice, particularly now that, that it, global travel is, is kind of prohibitive. Right? So it, you know, it, when we used to go into the same place, we also had to worry about we didn't have to worry about time zones because everybody was in the same place. So you just have one agenda. Now you actually have to create events and try to rerun them multiple times so that, that people from different time zones can all join at a reasonable time. Otherwise, they're joining at 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, which is, which is very unreasonable. Which, um, you know, th- those are the kind of things that, are, that are, um, we need to start considering more. Right? And the ability for, for people to join on, on non-VR devices is also very important. And we find that, you know, over the last few months, more and more actually users are joining on non-VR devices because initially it was all only VR people that cared, right? So it was very high percentage of VR devices. Now, now that we've got mobile phones and, and PCs that can all join, we're starting to see a bigger, bigger percentage of non-VR devices joining these virtual events. So, so I, but, but now we're expanding that audience, right? And I think that's really the key is that getting people to tip their toes into the, the spatial computing kind of metaphor. Now, now, once they've done that and they see, oh, you know, how come they can move their hands and the mind, my guy can just move around and walk, but they, they can't move your hands or head? Well, because you're on a PC instead of somebody who's on, you know, who's on a, a VR device. They go, oh, then I want to get a VR device. Right? So I think that if you see what happened with uh, VR chat, that's also kind of one of the things that um, is an interesting uh, experiment that kind of worked, you know, where now probably 70% of their users are non-VR users, but a lot of the non-VR users are actually buying Vive trackers to put onto their bodies so that they can move around inside VR and be able to do uh, you know, more active things with other users so that they're seen as a, a first-class citizen instead of a second-class citizen inside, inside the virtual reality. So, um, but but I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future, and I think I think uh, we, we've moved a, a, a big step in terms of, of towards that mass adoption that you guys were talking about. Can I ask you uh, a bit more about this future, Alvin? What is missing still right now? With, with that in particular, like we talked about these 
milestones that have enabled the growth of the industry so far these interesting things that have changed it so yeah what is that thing that next milestone that next thing that we're going to say okay that's the next thing that unlocks this People are talking about 5G and cloud rendered XR. Uh, people are talking about miniaturization of the devices thanks to you know uh, moving the computing power for from the devices to the cloud. Is this the next step? Is this the natural step? Or there's something in between that needs to change in terms of ergonomics, technology, or whatever. Business. Yeah. I mean, I, well. I, I think you know we, we went a long ways from having the wire devices to something like this that's a standalone, right? So I think this is this is this was a very big step, right? And now you know this year there's also the Quest Two that came out, you know, similar type of form factor. I, I think the, the the next thing will be able to to get that to more goggle type size, something that you can wear longer, right? These devices are you know two hours. If if you wear more than two hours, you're you're pretty a little bit tired, right? Whether you're because of the weight or whether because of the, the pressure and blah, blah, blah. I, I think we need to we need to get these devices smaller, thinner, lighter, uh, be able to wear longer, uh, be able to have the batteries last longer. Uh, some of that will be um, assisted by the 5G uh, technology because that will allow a lot of processing to happen uh, off the device, right? Um, some of it will actually also be happening where you're doing dual rendering, where part of it may be done on a high-end phone, part of it may be on the device itself, part of it may be on a, uh, a cloud device so that you can split, split the, the computing capabilities to allow uh, less processing uh, on the, the head. Right? So, so I think a lot of those, those things will happen over the next few years. And uh, you know, uh, I think even at our, at our launch event a, a few weeks ago, uh, Qualcomm came in, you know, Hugo from Qualcomm came in and spoke about their their viewer, uh, their smart viewer type of uh, technologies. And I think, you know, that's, there's already companies that are, are making these kind of viewers. Um, and, you know, they, they initially will probably still require wires to connect to a, a 5G phone or a computing pod. But uh, I think over time, those those pods and these phones will become more and more wireless connected. Uh, you know, there'll be more uh, off-device rendering in the clouds. The clouds, I think, is still taking a little bit longer than a lot of people expect. Uh, one is, I think, the networks it will take longer to really have broad coverage. The other thing is the uh, edge services and edge servers will take more time for it to really optimize to provide um, uh, quality and of service uh, response time. Right? Um, but I think over time, these things will, will all work itself out. What about things like um, like affordability of like I know we spoke about it like in the in the ni- in, in the nineties one of the big factors that hindered it was affordability. Do you think that that's also something that's going to be a milestone for VR? And I, I, honestly, I, I I think at this point right now the thing that's holding it back is not cost. It's not the price, right? I mean, you have Quest that is a three hundred dollar device. Uh, you know, there are very few decent phones that are less than three hundred dollars, right? Uh, but but phone, phones that are you know three four five hundred dollars are selling in the tens of millions of units. So so I, I don't I don't think there's uh, the price is really the, the issue. The issue right now is really having use cases and applications that that provide immediate clear value, right? Value that that makes the the change of behavior worth it. Uh, I think one of the things that will happen soon is the ability to to be able to read inside these devices, the ability to be able to to surf the web and read documents. So that I can replace the monitor that's in front of me. I think that that is going to be a key milestone for VR devices because once you have the monitor replacement, then I'm already used to putting this on a long time. Whether whether it's connected to your PC or whether it's connected to the cloud, it really doesn't matter. The fact that I'm I'm now using this as a um, daily use device, right? I, I, unfortunately, I think right now most VR devices are not being used that way. Can I um, ask your point of view on the um, quotes that's, uh, I mean, I'm reading right here, Jim Ryan from uh, the CEO of Sony PlayStation just a few days ago uh, said that uh, uh, virtual reality won't be a meaningful part of interactive entertainment in the near future. What do you think about this quote? Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. <laughs> uh, I, I think you know, every company has their own perspective. Um, you know, I, I, 
I think PlayStation actually, has been they, one of the first company to experiment with virtual reality for mass markets, and they've been very successful, apparently. Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, they, they sold, th I think, five or six or seven million units, which, which I think it's, it's significant. They're, they're probably one of the best-selling XR devices out there, right? So, so I'm, I'm actually a little surprised he said that. Um, but, you know, I... I, I I, I don't think I agree with it, and I think he'll be proven wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, just, just the fact that you, if you spend some time just playing something like Half-Life Alex, uh, I, I don't see a more entertaining type of experience uh, out there than something like that, right? It, it's really about, you know, if we had 10 more entertainment titles that look like that this year, uh, you know, I think it's a very different story. So it's really a matter of, it's really a matter of, uh, you know, will AAA studios put the time and effort to as, as much time and effort in VR content as they do in PC or, you know, uh, console content? If they did, and they're spending $50, $100 million on these content, you're going to have some really amazing uh, VR uh, entertainment content, right? So I, I think that's, that's um, very possible. I think another thing that, that's happening that will probably make this even more likely is the fact that almost all major movies now, uh, especially you know, big budget movies, are doing their special effects in VR, doing everything is, is in, in, you know, rendered in engines instead of, instead of in, in physical space. And so all the models are already there, right? I mean, even if you look at what we did with uh, Ready Player One in 2018 and 2017, I mean, they gave us their entire 3D model library. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of those stuff was just way too high, high quality for us to use in the game. Um, so we had to dumb down or render down almost everything they gave us. But, you know, we were able to create the environments that, that were exactly like the, 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 the movie. And then the characters were from the movies, the, 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 the sets, you know, the, all the, you know, the, uh, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the NPCs etc etc right so so I think that's something that uh, the fact that all that content is created a lot of the most of the cost actually in in game creation is actually those content creation is is the asset creation so if a lot of the assets done then it's really about the the, the story and scripting which uh, I don't think it's a lot of additional cost to make the VR content uh, uh, capable so so I, I I'm actually very optimistic that it will become a, uh, a very prominent part of, of entertainment going forward. In fact, I think once people start getting a bigger taste of this, uh, it's hard to go back to just looking at hmm. So, So what's the next uh, kind of HTC device going to look like? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm uh, not allowed to talk about future devices, but I, I, I will say that we do have devices coming out in 2021. And I think uh, it will be um, something that are that is breakthrough devices that people will will uh, have that same level of excitement that they did back in the 2016 when we uh, came out with the initial vibe. So I'm so I'm actually quite uh, quite excited about what what's coming, and I, I think the uh, it, it will it will take the industry um, you know to to another level. Okay, so you can't tell me exactly wow. what the device is. <laughs> That's a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, which NBA player is going to test it first then? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure there will be a, a lot of people uh, waiting in line to test it. So, uh, but, but, you know, we, we will be getting devices, some you know, dev kits out to our, our developers and, and hoping that there will be some really cool content that comes out with it. Yeah. No, that's awesome. The only reason I joke is because I can imagine you sitting in, in the boardroom right now and uh, encouraging everyone else to, to choose the NBA player, looking at the, the history from uh, kind of Yao Ming through to kind of Kobe. So I'm just, just, just it's on my notes. I can see that there and I, I can see you pushing that through as your agenda. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think there, there's uh, plenty of, uh, of options, but yeah, it was, uh, Kobe was a really fun thing because actually that, that day was the double eleven uh, festival 2017 uh, and we had the, oh no 2016 actually it was the, it was uh, about three or four months after uh, the oculus uh, CTO said oh you know wireless base the VR will, will not happen for five years right and then we actually demoed 
with Kobe using our wireless device uh, to do wireless PC VR streaming with one of our Vivex companies. So, um, you know, I, 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 it just goes to show how quickly the industry is, is capable of moving uh, when, you, when you put the right uh, talent together and when you take the, quali- the, the, the innovation that, that's in startups together with the golden market capabilities of larger corporations. So, um, but, you know, definitely, you know, uh, we'll, we'll make sure when, when we have our next product launch, we'll have some, uh, some uh, good spokespeople that come and help us highlight, highlight the technology. Though I mean, Nick could be waiting here for our uh, our dev kit as well. It's fine. Oh, absolutely. If you want to send us a test kit, we are more than happy to provide feedback and everything. <laughs> uh, you're you're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> so Alvin, thank you so much for being with us. This has been such an insightful conversation. It was absolutely a pleasure to have you here. Oh, uh, again, you know, thanks for inviting me. I, I uh, am honored to be here, and I. Uh, you know, look forward to uh, joining the, the VR days and uh, the VR awards and seeing all the, the cool stuff that you guys have prepared. And uh, for all the viewers, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, please stay tuned because we're going to have some amazing guests in the forthcoming episodes. Uh, please tune in for the VR awards. Uh, just watch the recording. This episode is going to be broadcasted after the VR awards, but watch the recording on YouTube. And uh, thank you for being with us. Yeah, and as always, you know, one of the biggest things of Field of View is we want to make sure that we kind of get your feedback and we get your kind of people that you want to speak to. So um, in the, in future episodes, as we're able to announce more and more guests coming on, uh, we'll also be kind of opening it up to the floor to you to be able to tweet us any questions and message us any questions that you want to ask our guests as well. Uh, so if you have any ideas of the kind of people that you want on Field of View, or if you have any ideas of the kind of questions that you want us asking, make sure to get in touch. Make sure you to subscribe on all all your favorite podcast platforms from uh, kind of Spotify through to our video, which you, will, you can find on YouTube as well. So you might be listening to our voices, but you can see our pretty faces as well. Um, <laughs> um, but as always, thank you so much from AIXR, Accenture, um, Field of View, and thank you very much, Alvin, for kind of joining us today. Through accessible insights, a solid network of support, and recognizing truly outstanding achievements near or far. Big or small, we're in this together. AIXR.